do you have the no Okay, so let's look at the first uh, handout, which is on Nyquist, Bode plot, and root locus. So you see the three plots right next to each other. Um, yeah, they are calling it polar plot, so Nyquist is similar to polar um, for many for many functions. So uh, what I want you to notice is. Okay, let's look at the root locus for the first system, which is k over s tau 1 plus 1. If you look at the Nyquist plot, no matter how large the gain k is, uh, it's not going to encircle minus 1, 0 point, and therefore uh, it will have. Um, it will be stable no matter what value of k you pick. So it's apparent both from polar plot as well as from the root locus because in the root locus case, the pole is escaping to infinity as k increases. So this is what the root locus looks like. So this pole escapes to minus infinity. Uh, and it's stable for all values of gain k. And if you look at the Bode plot, the Phase never touches minus 180 degree line, and therefore the phase margin is infinity in this case. Sorry, the gain margin is infinity in this case. Okay, so it's a stable system for all values of gain k. Next, I want to draw your attention to number three. And number three is something that we have seen before. So for large values of gain k, you can see that the in the root locus that the poles become unstable, the closed loop poles are unstable. And we can observe the same thing with polar plot or Nyquist plot, as well as the Bode diagram. Um, so for large values of uh, gain k, the gain margin is negative. Um, and the, there are two encirclements of minus one zero point in the Nyquist plot. Okay, can everyone see that in this handout? Let's look at uh, some other plots in the back. Oh, so this one is pretty cool. Let's look at number seven. So we have a zero in this case. And we have two poles. So in this particular situation, again, we have, uh, if you look at the root locus, no matter what value of gain k you pick, the root locus is always on the stable region. Uh, so all the poles are stable. Uh, we see the same thing with the Nyquist plot as well. So no matter what value of gain k you pick, the Nyquist plot is not going to encircle minus 1, 0. And therefore, the system will be stable for all values of gain k. Um, and you see the same thing in the Bode diagram as well, where you have a positive phase margin. And therefore, the system is going to be stable for all values of gain k. So that's all I wanted to show. I, I know I meant to give this to you long time back, but for some reason I forgot that I have not printed it at all. Uh, in my head I had printed it, but in reality I did not print it. So now I did, so you all have it, have this. You can just observe how the gain margin, phase margin, root locus, and Nyquist plot, all, all, all these tools come together in this very nice little handout for uh, I think eight different transfer functions.
Uh, for the midterm, uh, I think the syllabus would be everything we have studied until last Friday. Um, so that includes the PI controller design using um, using body plot, so which is what we did in the previous class. And then we have done Nyquist plot, so stability of closed loop system using Nyquist plot. Uh, we have done root locus and stability of closed loop system using root locus. So all of this is part of the syllabus. So everything we did after midterm one, so root Hurwitz, root locus, frequency response, uh, Nyquist plot, so and body plot. So all of these are part of your midterm two syllabus. You are allowed to have one more cheat sheet, so you have two cheat sheets. So uh, four sides, not four sides, like two sides of each sheet. So you have four pages of uh, cheat sheet that you can write, type, print, whatever you want to do. Um, I don't know if you need more cheat sheet than two pages. Anyone thinks that you need more than two pages? No? <laughs> OK. OK, then two pages it is. In the final exam, I'll allow you three pages of cheat sheet. So you'll have ample time to review your course notes during the exam. Yeah. Uh, will we have to draw anything for the midterm? No. So no drawing. No drawing. Anyone else has other questions like this? <laughs> you can probe. Uh, you can ask every kind of question, and then you can figure out what the actual questions are going to be. <laughs> Is this going to be on midterm? Is that going to be? A, yeah, what's your question? Assignment four and five. Sorry? Is it just assignment four and five based on those? Yeah, assignment four and five, yeah. yeah. So assignments one, two, three were part of midterm one, right? Yeah, so assignments four and five is part of midterm two. Um, can we expect a really long hand calculations, or should we? Did, did you have any question like that in midterm one? Um, I don't think so. No. So, no, so then you shouldn't expect that in okay. midterm two so as well. Taking us thirty minutes to solve a problem. We'll probably so I should be able to do it in ten minutes, right? Okay. In order for me to uh, give you fifty minutes to solve those problems. So, okay. yeah, you know the problem with long calculations is it's also difficult to grade, and usually they are not conceptual questions. So I don't like to give non-conceptual questions in midterm. Just have some concepts, and then you need to apply them. Did you say Ruth Array is on this? Or yes, is on because it wasn't part of your midterm one. OK. So today's topic is lead compensator design. And I want to motivate the discussion with a general form for controller. So So we have this feedback controller, R of S, Y of S. And we can pick any controller we want. And so far, we had concentrated mostly on simple gain controller. So GC was equal to gain. So this is a gain controller. Sometimes when we wanted to be more bold, we picked a PI controller, KP plus KI over S, which is the same as KP KI over KP over S. Um, so this is the PI controller. We had talked about PID controller a while back, but uh, we didn't really design any PID controller. It's part of your project, so you will definitely have some experience designing a PID controller. And the form of PID controller is KP plus KI over S plus KDS. And this can be written as K. S plus Z1, S plus Z2 over S. This is PID controller. OK. 
Okay. I'm going to summarize what we have done so far um, before we jump on to lead and lag compensator design. So we have talked about gain controller and root locus, Nyquist plot, root Horvitz, all of this were important in designing a gain K that satisfies uh, at least stability condition and perhaps uh, a little bit of, uh, we could some, sometimes design or transient conditions as well using a, just a simple gain controller. Uh, then PI controllers are usually used when we wanted to eliminate steady state error with respect to certain inputs. So then we use PI controller. PID controllers were used whenever we wanted to, or it's generally used whenever you want to control both the transient as well as steady state performance. So that way, placing these two zeros will alter the root locus substantially, and that will allow you to place the poles uh, of the closed loop system in an appropriate location so as to uh, make sure that you meet all the transient requirements as well as steady state requirements. But now, what you see is a pattern emerging in the sequence of controllers that we are designing. So what essentially is a controller doing? A controller, more generally, is just a system with multiple zeros and multiple poles, P, J, J equals one to N, I equals one to M. M and N could be any number. This is a general form Okay, and the very cool thing with uh, these three controllers is that you see a progressively higher number of uh, sophistication. So in the case of simple gain controller, there are no poles, no zeros. In the case of a PI controller, you have a pole at, so the controller itself has a pole at origin and it has a zero which you can place appropriately in the complex plane or in the real axis based on your knowledge of, based on your uh, uh, parameters ki and kp both of them are tunable parameters you can pick according to your wishes in the case of pid controller you can place two zeros and in fact these two zeros could be complex numbers okay so they need not be real numbers and by appropriately picking kp ki and kd you can place the zeros anywhere in the complex plane and then you put a pole at the origin right so, <clears throat> so it turns out that if you want to design a general controller, you can assume a form of this type, and then you have to appropriately place zi's, pj's, and k, and pick an appropriate value of gain k so that two things are satisfied. The first is transient behavior specification second is stability so you want to change an unstable system to a stable system um, noise attenuation And then the fourth is uh, steady state error performance. Okay, so these are the these are known as design specifications.
And your job as a controls engineer would be to meet these specifications by picking a, an appropriate controller of this particular form, okay? And P, PI, and PID controllers or PD controllers are instance, instances of such a general form for controllers. Okay. What's the simplest controller that doesn't belong to P, PI, or PID case and is has this kind of structure, so that simplest form for controller would be S plus Z over S plus P, right? So you have one numerator, one denominator. That's it, single zero and single pole. And this differs from all these three controllers in a fundamental way. What we are going to, so, so this kind of controller is known as a lead compensator or a lag compensator, depending upon the locations of the zeros and, location of the zero and pole. Okay. And that's what we are going to learn, how to design a lead compensator or a lag compensator in the subsequent classes, yeah. So is that a PID controller or no? This is not a PID controller. So a PID controller would have two zeros and a pole at the origin. Uh, here I'm just adding one zero and one pole. That's it, yes. What this we will do is to compensate for delays or stop? Um, you can use this to meet any of the design specifications. So uh, the delay doesn't, create a problem if it doesn't, so delay is not a problem if your perf design specifications are already met with a regular controller. You know, only if the design specifications cannot be met with a regular, let's say, gain controller, then you want to design something which is more sophisticated. So you could use PI, PID, or you could use a lead compensator or a lag compensator. Any other question? Okay, what we have done in the past, based on the design specifications, we have identified a few things, okay? So these design specifications essentially translates to where should the dominant closed loop poles be, okay? That has, that has been the first question on our mind. So you're given a percent overshoot condition that tells you your zeta has to be within certain bounds. If you're given a settling time, then you know that zeta omega n has to be within certain bounds for, a, um, for the dominant poles. If you're given stability, you want the dominant poles to be on the, um, what is this side? Left half plane, okay. Uh, and then if you need noise attenuation, then you want to make sure that you have a Bode diagram and then the slope of the Bode diagram has certain properties so that you can attenuate noises, uh, or you can increase the phase angle in order to improve the phase margin, which again leads back to the question of stability. So you want to improve your phase margin or a gain, gain margin, and that, uh, uh, that can also be done by picking an appropriate controller. So in the previous class, we talked about PI controller and how it can be used to improve the phase margin. And then, uh, the steady state error performance in most of the times that we have seen so far, we have just used PI controller to improve the steady state error or drive it to zero. And in many cases, you may not want to use a PID controller because you have a pole at the origin, so it might make the closed loop system unstable. So you may want to use a compensator of this type uh, with non-zero zero and non-zero pole so that you don't put anything at the origin and make the system potentially unstable. So let's talk about lead compensator uh, and where is lead compensator useful.
So the pole zero diagram of a lead compensator looks like this. You have a zero and you have a pole. That's a lead compensator. So this is the pole zero diagram. And if I look at the body plot, the phase angle looks something like this. So this is angle of GC of S or GC of J omega and this is 20 log absolute value of GC of J omega and that's something like this yeah this is my zero this is my pole this is square root zp This is small, <coughs> it's a real number, so it's zero, yeah. Okay, so for small values of omega, if I look at the phase angle, it's k z over p, so the phase angle will be almost equal to zero. And for large values of omega, uh, this will again be close to a real number and therefore the phase angle will be close to zero. For the lead compensator. Um, now, because it has a zero and a pole, the body diagram is going to look flat all the way until zero. As soon as you hit the zero, you have an upward slope of 20 dB per decade. And then as soon as you hit the pole, the slope again becomes zero because you have a zero and a pole. And this level is 20 log alpha, and this is zero. I, I'm not very sure why it says zero in the book, uh, because would it be zero? So if S is close to zero, this should be Kz over P, and that's not equal to zero dB. So I'm not quite sure why the book says it starts from 0 dB. But this is the general shape. Sorry? Are they assuming k is 1? Uh, even then, if, if s is close to 0 j, yeah. then it should be z over p, and that's not equal to 1, because your z and p are distinct points. So. Okay, so we'll think about this part later. It's not very important, but the slope, the, how the slope changes is important for the Bode diagram. Um, so this of course increases the gain for high frequencies, but it also improves the phase, it adds to the phase angle. So this would be, I don't know, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees, let me, put 90 degree a little bit above. 
So you can actually add phase angle at certain frequency or certain range of frequencies by using a lead compensator. And that's precisely why people use lead compensator is to add a phase margin to the system, add to the phase margin of the system. And if you look at the pole zero diagram, having a zero at a specific location allows you to attract the root locus of the overall system, so root locus of GCG, it tends to attract it towards closer to zero, okay? So that's the goal, that's the reason why we use a, a, a lead compensator. So the reasons or benefits, the first benefit is adds phase margin to a system, which further implies it improves stability of closed loop system. It attracts the closed loop poles of the, or I, I want to say dominant closed loop poles. Attracts dominant closed loop poles towards zero, towards the zero Z, and this improves the transient performance. Okay. So whenever you have a system where whose transient behavior specification is not met using a simple P controller, simple gain controller, it should immediately click to you that we need to use a lead compensator, okay? Because a lead compensator will attract the closed loop poles towards the zero Z. So by carefully placing the zero of the lead compensator at an appropriate location on the negative real axis, you can actually attract the root locus around zero and that will improve the transient performance of your system. Similarly, if your system is behaving, uh, if the closed loop system could become unstable or is very close to instability, um, you may want to add phase margin to the system, and again, the lead compensator would be very useful in improving the, the uh, stability of the closed loop system. Now I want to talk about lag compensator, which is exactly opposite of that. So if you look at the pole zero diagram, it has a pole first and a zero later. And both values of pole and zero are very, very small. So small values.
So this is the angle of GC. This is the uh, 20 log absolute value of GC. And this would be exactly opposite of that. So looks something like this. This is the pole, this is the zero, and this is square root of PZ. This slope is minus 20 dB per decade. Okay, so what is lag compensator? What's the purpose of lag compensator? So first, uh, use improve steady state error performance. as a PI controller, uh, not as a, but as an approximate PI controller, as an approximate PI controller. So if you look at a PI controller, it starts with minus 20 dB per decade because the pole is at zero. And then it starts um, flattening out at the zero of the PI controller. Whereas in this case, because you put a pole at a non-trivial, at, not at the origin, you have some zero dB, not zero dB, but a zero dB slope line uh, at the beginning of the, uh, at low frequencies. And then at higher frequencies, again, you have zero dB line, uh, zero dB slope line, um, which is very similar to the PI controller case. So it acts as an approximate PI controller, and that's why it improves the steady state error performance. But it has a downside, makes system, so closed loop makes closed loop system unstable. At low frequencies, yeah. Okay, so you, it's always stable no matter what. <laughs> so if your original system has very large stability margin, a lag compensator will not really affect the stability performance. But if it has very small stability margin, let's say your phase margin was only five or six degrees, and you applied, a, you used a lag compensator, then suddenly you have um, created a problem for yourself because it could reduce the phase because of this negative dip in the phase angle for the lag compensator. So it doesn't always necessarily make the system unstable, but it could. It could become, it could make it unstable. Um, actually, I've written make system unstable. I really mean could make system unstable. Could make closed loop system unstable. So it reduces stability margins okay now I have a question for you I want to improve the transient behavior and I also want to improve the steady state performance how will I achieve that what should I do
more than one controller? How would you, how would you organize it? Cascade them. Yeah. So my question is, so a lead compensator uh, improves the transient performance. A lag compensator improves the steady state error performance. If I'm given a design specification that involves improving both the transient performance as well as steady state error performance, what should I do? OK. And so her idea is uh, to cascade a lead compensator and a lag compensator. What are the other thoughts? How can I achieve that? Yeah. Add another, so how would you add another pole? So let, let's, let's think about it. So idea number one is GC1, GC2, G. Okay, so this is cascading two controllers. Idea number two is GC1, and then you want to add pole here. Okay. One over S, G, with a negative feedback. This is idea number two. How about GC1, GC2, G, okay, so I have, I have Given three architectures, I want some of you, so this is my architecture, okay? I want some of you to come up with some other architectures that I could use to improve both the transient as well as steady state error performance. What other things can I do? Yeah. This, this side? Um, so if you change something on this side, it means that you are adding a new sensor on the system. Okay. So it's not necessarily adding a new controller, it's just adding a new sensor. Okay. So in the case of a car, you have radar, that's one sensor, and then you put a camera, that's just completely different sensor, right? So that's changing the feedback loop. Yes? So you are also in favor of cascading controllers, right? Yeah, but instead of a lead and a lag. Yeah, maybe yeah. I mean, whatever, some other form of controller. Yeah, but yeah. cascading is what you want to do, okay. of a PI controller plus a lead plus a lag, or okay. that's what you want to do. That's what you're suggesting. Maybe not a lead and a lag, because that would be considered yeah. those would just cancel each other. Yeah. But, um, that's fine. Yeah. So this is GC1 and GC2, so you can pick GC1 and GC2 according to any fashion. Okay, so it does turn out that cascaded controller is the way to go. Okay, so my idea was wrong. And this idea is very similar to the cascaded controller, except that instead of using a regular integrator, you could add a KP term that becomes a PI controller. That's what she was talking about. Okay, so cascaded way of uh, designing a controller is one of the most useful way of uh, uh, designing controller to meet both the steady state error specifications as well as the um, transient specification. So you could use a lead compensator to improve the transient specifications. You could use a PI or a, uh, a lag compensator 
to uh, meet the steady state error specifications for the closed loop system. Okay, so that's the way to go. So the cas cascaded controller is the way to go. And if you have, um, and this is something you will do in your project where you need to design a lead compensator and a lag compensator to meet all the specifications. Yes. So this is just adding, this is equivalent to adding two controllers. GC1 plus GC2, that's what my idea was. And adding the two controllers is not the same as improving the specifications because you want to be able to add the body plots and meet low frequency specifications, high frequency specifications, and mid frequency specifications. Okay, so. It would do something though, right? Well, it's a P plus I controller, whatever, yeah. It, it does something, but it's the sum of, uh, yeah, it's basically just a PI controller or a, you don't do a lead plus lag controller. That's, that's some weird controller. I've never thought about what lead plus lag would do, but certainly lead and lag cascaded to each other would be very beneficial. So this is equivalent to saying you want to multiply the two transfer functions for the controller. Okay? All right. Let me put these numbers so that there is no confusion. So at low frequencies, this would be 20 log k z over p. And this would be 20 log k. And here, again, 20 log k z over p. And this would be 20 log k. So at high frequencies, uh, this will be 20 log k, same thing there. At low frequencies, this will be 20 log k z over p, and the same thing there. Okay. So uh, lag compensators cheaper than PI controllers? Why would you say cheaper? If you wanted to use that instead of like a PI controller. Uh, no, so PI controller adds a pole at origin. So if you already have a pole at origin in the original system, then your closed loop system becomes unstable because it has two poles at the origin. So that's, so let me think about it. So if I have KP plus KI over S multiplied by one over S, this would be the closed loop system, right? So this is KP S plus KI over S square plus KPS plus KI. Okay, so it may not be unstable, but uh, I think you could use KI, PI controller when it is, um, so it acts as an approximate PI controller, so if you can use a PI controller, use a PI controller, but if you have to design a lag compensator, then you need to use lag compensator. Um, I'm not very sure in what conditions PI controller would make the closed loop system unstable. I'm trying to think about it, uh, but it doesn't seem like there would be an obvious answer to that question. What if I have a double integrator here? No, it still works. 
plus ki. Okay, so I don't know under what conditions would the pi controller make the system unstable, but you could pick pi if it works for you. You could pick a lag compensator if pi doesn't work for you. Certainly pi is a much better form of uh, controller than a lag, lag compensator, yes. If you pick a, uh, like a pi controller and you have a pull to origin, oh. the risk of it drifting into the right half, like. I see what you're saying. So if your original system has an S term, if you have a zero in the original system at origin, is that what your concern is? Uh, so if KP plus KI over S multiplied by S over S plus one, if that's your system transfer function, then you have an S in the denominator and S in the numerator. Is that what your concern is? No? PI controllers in general. Mm -hmm. There's always a pull at the origin, right? Yeah, there's always a pole at the origin. So is that like bad? Don't we want our poles always as far left as possible? Uh, for the closed loop system, yes. But this is what we are talking about is poles of the open loop system. Right? So you have, an, you have a pole at the origin for the open loop system. The question is when you close the loop, where is that pole going to drift towards? Well, it could be, yeah could go towards left, it may not go towards left, I don't know. Okay, let me think about it a little bit more. Uh, when is a PI controller more appropriate and when is a lag com controller more appropriate? I need to figure out under what conditions would a lag controller be much better than a PI controller. Okay. So, What we are going to do in the next class is, what I've given you is a handout on lead compensator design and lag compensator design. So there are certain steps that you need to follow when you're designing a lead controller or a lag controller. So we are going to follow these design uh, sequence and design controllers for some specific systems as, as an example and then of course you will do it uh, in both the assignment six as well as in your project. So you will get more hands-on experience with designing a lead and lag controller. So that's all I have. Uh, I'll see you guys on Wednesday.